uh, I think we start the proceedings of this inaugural uh, Dilip Mahalanabhi Shoration. On behalf of Liver Foundation, we are really grateful to uh, Richard Cash for coming all the way to deliver this oration uh, and to all of you who spared time and decided came forward to join us. For the proceedings uh, of the evening, I would request uh, Professor Partho Pratim Mujumdar, who is National Science Chair and uh, Distinguished uh, Professor at John C. Martin Center for Liver Research and Innovations, uh, Liver Foundation, West Bengal, uh, to come over to the dais and uh, start the proceedings. I would also request Richard Cash to join us on the dais. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are all aware why we have assembled here. Uh, Dr. Dilip Mahalanobis passed away on 16th of October last year. Um, so many of us who, were, who knew him were kind of close to him, thought that we must start a series in his memory. And it was uh, Professor Dr. Abhijit Choudhury who took the leadership and initiated this activity. So today we have assembled here um, to hear the first uh, Dr. Dilip Mahalanobis memorial oration. Uh, Dr. Dilip Mahalanobis was born on 12th of November 1934 uh, in East Bengal, now Bangladesh. Uh, he studied medicine and specialized in pediatrics in Calcutta. Uh, he then went over to the UK and uh, um, got his degrees from Queen Elizabeth Hospital for Children in London and then uh, later to the United States from the Johns Hopkins University where he trained himself or got trained in public health. Dr. Mahalanobis pioneered the practical use of ORS on a large scale. Breakthrough work began in 1971 which was the Bangladesh War of Independence. The simple solution consisting of sugar, salts and water has helped save lives of millions of several dehydrated adults, children, and infants. It was at the time of the Bangladesh War of Independence in 1971. Lots of refugees came over and refugee camps were filled to the brim. And it was also a full monsoon time. Uh, the season in between meant that the situation became very complicated. Cholera had broken out and the refugee shelter area was overrun with vomit and feces especially in the Bongao um, border area. That, that's a sort of land border and people crossed over. Uh, intravenous saline solution was exhausted. Malanobis decided to use ORS since uh, oral rehydration solution was yet to receive global acknowledgement. The government medical team was skeptical and even tried to stop him from using it. Mahanobis delivered ORT to more than 3,000 people with cholera, and it worked. And that it did in a public health emergency where so many lives were at stake. The success paved the way for ORS to be taken more seriously, especially by global public health organizations and later adopted on a larger scale. Mahanobis founded the research organization Society for Applied Studies in West Bengal in 1990 with a vision of better health and quality of life, especially for women and children. The institution later expanded to include the New Delhi based Center for Health Research and Development Society for Applied Studies. And we have several representatives of CHRD SAS. Prior to establishing the Society for Applied Studies, Dr. Mahalanobis worked in the World Health Organization's Diarrheal Disease Control Program and thereafter served as a director of clinical research at Bangladesh-based International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research. Mahalanobis was a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He received first ever Pollen Prize for Pediatric Research some years later, he received the Prince Mahidol Prize along with Dr. Richard Cash, who is going to deliver the first Dilip Mahalanobis Memorial Oration and Dr. David Nallen for their work on oral therapy. Like I said, Dr. Cash is going to deliver the first Mahalanobis Oration, so let me say a few words about Dr. Cash. Um, Dr. Cash, of course, 
is one of the major uh, architects of the use of oral rehydration solution and oral rehydration therapy. Uh, Dr. Cash obtained his MD from New York University School of Medicine and Master of Public Health from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. For many years, he's been on the faculty of Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Cash is truly an international scientist. He began his international career for over several decades ago. Uh, he tells me that he came here to this uh, part of the world in 1967, which is 55 years ago, uh, and he started in the cholera research laboratory in Dhaka, then East Pakistan. And he was telling me of telling me stories of how he would come to India and it wasn't very easy. Uh, it was East Pakistan still. The laboratory grew to become the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research Bangladesh. Dr. Cash and his colleagues developed and conducted the first clinical trials of oral rehydration therapy in adult and pediatric patients with diarrheal diseases, including cholera. ORT is estimated to have saved about 100 million lives. Dr. Cash has a deep commitment to capacity building for health research and management in less affluent countries. And he's come to Bangladesh, he's come to India for, and spent many years uh, in both of these countries and elsewhere. He was the director of the program on ethical issues in international health research for many years and conducted training workshops in South America, Africa, India and the Middle East. Uh, a sentence, a personal sentence, the time when I met Dr. Cash for the first time was at the Fogarty International Center where I had got, gone to get some training in research methodology and Dr. Cash came and uh, taught us ethics in research. So that was the first time many years ago, I was much younger then, uh, many years ago and I fondly remember my first meeting with Dr. Cash. Subsequently, he's been here. He went to the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics when I was setting that up. So I have a lot of uh, personal reminiscences and personal acquaintances with uh, Dr. Cash. Dr. Cash has visiting a faculty appointments at the James Grant School of Public Health at Brack University in Bangladesh. Uh, the Achuta Menon Center for Health Sciences Studies in Trivandrum, and the Graduate School of International Health Development at the University of Nagasaki. On the 25th anniversary of the development of oral rehydration therapy, he had gotten a special citation from the government of Bangladesh. Uh, as I said, he also is a recipient, along with Dr. Dilip Mahalanobis, of the Prince Mahidol Award in 2007. He, in 2011, he won the uh, Fries Prize for Improving Health. I will end by saying that Dr. Mahalanobis uh, actually obtained uh, or was awarded Padmabhi Bhushan uh, for, uh, posthumously for his work in saving the lives of adults and children by uh, practical use of uh, oral rehydration solution. We will hear more about the development of uh, ORS and ORT from uh, Dr. Richard Cash and we are very, very grateful that Dr. Cash uh, can come here to deliver the first Dilip Mahalanobis Memorial Oration. Dr. Cash. May I also invite uh, Dr. Ashokananda Konar uh, to actually deliver him um, a shawl or greet him with a shawl. And uh, may I also invite uh, Dr. Amal Satra to deliver uh, or to hand over a memento uh, to Dr. Cash. Dr. Cash, the podium is yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I was saying in the, earlier that I first came here, I think it was 1967, when I uh, first came to Dhaka, which was then East Pakistan. Uh, getting over to Calcutta was quite a chore for us. Uh, we could cross the border at Benapol, uh, and, uh, but you had to put in a request about a month or two ahead of time and then take a, a flight, a baby taxi, a bicycle rickshaw, a, a car, and a train. 
just to get here. So the easiest way to go is to fly to Kathmandu, spend the night, and then fly down to Calcutta, which I did. Because we always wanted to come here for the music season in December. Actually, once I came to Calcutta, I flew to Bangkok, spent the night, and then came up from Bangkok. So can you imagine that? To go 140 miles, I traveled about 2,000. Anyway, that was then and this is now. So what I thought I would do during the uh, course of my remarks here is to, is to uh, remember the leap through the work that uh, we had both been involved in, which was uh, uh, the development and implementation of oral rehydration therapy. Uh, and I've called that, I've called it taking science to the people and the problem because that's certainly what DELEAP did and it's what uh, drove all of us uh, into the direction of the development of ORS and ORT. And so what I'll do is I'm going to basically tell a story, a narrative, uh, because I've found over the years of many years of teaching that people remember the stories. They don't remember all those graphs and charts and data points and everything else. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story. And uh, I hope you find it interesting and uh, because I think that there are some really, really important issues and some important ideas that are just as relevant today as they were when we began this journey many, many years ago. So, you're all familiar with a lot of these uh, pictures that I'm going to show you, uh, but uh, it's to jog your memory. Here's a child severely dehydrated from cholera, uh, and you can see that sort of look, uh, far off look in his face. Here's a child, Fontanelle is depressed because of severe dehydration. And what are those signs? What are the signs of dehydration? There, a rapid pulse and rapid deep breathing. <gasps> to overcome the uh, metabolic acidosis that develops, uh, decreased skin turgor, pick up the skin on the back of your hand, it bounces back. All of the signs of severe dehydration are present uh, in children and adults who have this uh, condition. Now, when I first came to DACA, uh, this is the, uh, the pie chart of deaths of children, and you can see the diarrheal disease uh, made up the largest segment, almost 30%. It's interesting also to look at this graph because neonatal tetanus is no more. Whooping cough is way down. Measles, way down. The change, if you were to write and do a pie chart today, would be very different. Would be very, very different. Uh, and those are just a few of the... Uh, so, Bangladesh, you know, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's a land uh, covered with uh, all the rivers that come from India, and Nepal, and so on. Uh, it's a water-based society. It's a water-based society. And that's important to recognize because the cultures of any community, any country, is based on their relationship to their environment. So the uh, habits and the behavior uh, is very, very different than if we were talking about mountain societies. And these are pictures that some of you may recognize. These are boats that looked like they came out of the Middle Ages. But these were the boats that were around when I went there in 67. And this journey sort of begins with my entering into the story. Uh, today, None of these boats are, they're all uh, motorized. They're all uh, uh, drank up. But this was 55 years ago. I don't know whether any of you have uh, been to uh, uh, Bangladesh, but as I said, it's a hugely water-based society. Um, and here's a ghat that you're all familiar with, where clothes are washed and cows are washed and water is collected and, and uh, uh, all sorts of manner of things take place, bathing and so on. Early in the morning, collecting water and so on. So you can imagine that anything that is water related is going to be 
uh, highly uh, uh, transmitted in this environment. Now, you have two wells, you have deep wells, but at the time, these were not that well uh, distributed. Today they are, and today they are, in fact, uh, the uh, two wells are so well distributed that unfortunately you have another epidemic, that of arsenic intoxication, which was first picked up in uh, West Bengal uh, maybe 20 years ago or something of that nature. Uh, it's the largest example of mass poisoning that we have uh, in the world. And people collect water in every manner of uh, means, whether it's collecting it uh, uh, at, a, at a pump such as this or from a water truck and so on. Uh, it is important to recognize where the water is not directly in the house, that it's in slums and villages, that it's women who collect the water. It's the women who expend the energy to do this. You're all familiar with these pictures. Uh, washing vegetables in Kathmandu. Again, this is, we're going back 55 years. And of course, just upstream is a little girl doing what children do. So the, the, the notion of contamination is very, very, very uh, uh, predominant. And of course, we're all familiar with the types of sanitation that takes place in a number of the urban slum areas and so on. And, and across the, uh, that uh, body of water there are the high rises of the better off community. So one needn't go very far to see the linkages between, in an urban setting, between those who are poor and those who are uh, uh, well to do. And of course pictures such as this where the children are playing in the ponds and just as in West Bengal there are ponds all over Bangladesh uh, because people uh, dig out the, the land to build up the houses but unfortunately uh, the privies are right next to where the children are playing. So you can imagine the transmission that takes place and again we see children as innocents and yet children are the major uh, carrier of most enteric pathogens. And so using the uh, left hand, even though she's using the left hand to clean the baby's bottom, she of course touches her right hand and touches her sari uh, and so on. So the spread of enteric organisms is very easy to uh, put together in this sort of picture. So what would happen is that children would get diarrhea at home and they would come in by country boat to the uh, treatment centers. Now if you have to come in by country boat, not motorized boat or not a car or any other uh, motorized uh, uh, form of transport, you're going to wait a long time before you come in because you're going to take that boat in. There may not be a doctor or a nurse or any healthcare provider at the place that you go to. Uh, they may, you may get there, there may be no intravenous fluid or needles and syringes. Uh, and so you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you hope the diarrhea stops, and it doesn't. And so by the time you make it to the clinic, the child is, has severe uh, dehydration. And this accounted for the 30% of children who were dying of diarrhea. And of course, you could also come in by village ambulance, uh, which was uh, this. And you can imagine carrying somebody over a bridge like that uh, uh, in, a, in a rural setting. Or by bicycle rickshaw, or any other conveyance. The point is, is that the to come into a treatment center which may or may not have the provider or the medicines that you require is an effort. And so people stayed at home. And they stayed at home and they stayed at home too long. And so when they would come in, uh, they would either die at home or be in extremis by the time they reached the treatment center. Or you could take the treatment to people 
uh, in the field. But what are you taking? You're just carrying bottles of water. Okay, and so this was an outbreak up in the uh, Chittagong Hill tracks. Uh, and so as the average cholera patient took 10 liters, if you had the IV, you can imagine carrying 10 liters. If you don't know what it's like, you go home and fill up a bucket of water and carry it around the house for about 10 minutes and see how long you last, okay? And that's what this was. Or this is what would happen, is that people would be severely dehydrated, they get cholera, and obviously this is an extremely poor family. Just to show you how old this is, these pictures are, this is the Pakistan CETO Cholera Research Laboratory. Well, Pakistan dropped out of CETO and Bangladesh dropped out of Pakistan. But this is a picture like one of those Guinness Book of World Records that shows you this fellow, I think, took 98 liters. That was the equivalent of two and a half months of any income that he would generate. And this was IV that we produced. So this is from what is now the ICDDRB, but at that time was the Pakistan CETO Cholera Research Laboratory. The other problem, of course, is that you didn't have the proper equipment. This is a, uh, a container of pediatric scalp veins because they were so uh, rare at that time that people would clean them. Of course, we now know that all of the uh, conditions that you can pick up from a contaminated uh, intravenous fluid, uh, whether it's uh, HIV or malaria or uh, hepatitis, any number of different things. But these were being saved because they were so uh, in such demand. And this was a picture that you would see in any of the ID hospitals here in Calcutta or in Bangladesh, bed after bed of children uh, with IVs hanging from them. Uh, if they had the IV. Uh, and this, if they made it to the hospital and the IV was there. So there was a need for diarrhea therapy that was, one, inexpensive, the average person making $200 a year, easy to use because it had to be delivered by non-professionals, since there were no doctors and nurses in the rural areas. It had to be obviously physiologically sound, effective and acceptable. So the obvious route that you were going to have to give this solution in, because at this time, intravenous therapy was well recognized. And if you uh, came to a clinic and they had intravenous therapy, people knew how to use it, you could keep the mortality to under 1%. But it wasn't available. It wasn't there. You're all familiar, or if you're not, this is probably one of the most significant appropriate technology uh, inventions, a cholera cot. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but if not, it's simply a jute cot with a hole in it and a plastic sheet that overlaps this bed with a sleeve that goes into a bucket. And the individual uh, defecates uh, through the hole in the bed to the bucket and you can measure how much diarrhea stool they will have lost. Okay, and the simple uh, approach to treating diarrhea is you give back what the person has lost. You give back in, uh, uh, in a solution with a similar electrolyte content that which the person has lost. I remember when they had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, they were importing the absurdity of this. They were importing beds from the United States. Beds from the United States. God knows how much that must have cost. They could have made these up for a few bucks. And it turns out that in Ebola, diarrhea and dehydration are a major cause of mortality and morbidity. It's not bleeding from every orifice. It's a lot of it is related to diarrheal disease. So here's a lady who's been admitted. Again, these pictures are from 50 years ago. And you can see that typical look of uh, sort of a 
uh, uh, faces that were the individual is almost apathetic. You see the skin on her belly. Uh, she's lost skin turgor. Uh, her pulse is rapid or not perceptible. She's breathing deeply and rapidly. Uh, she's extremely thirsty. She has washerwoman hands, the kind of hand you get when your hand is in uh, water for a long period of time. And here she is receiving the oral uh, rehydration, the oral solution. Now you can't give it to her if she's in a coma or if, she, uh, if she's not alert, but in this case she is, and here she is 12 hours later. From that to that. It's probably, of all of the conditions that I treated when I was practicing medicine, which wasn't very long, uh, there is nothing more satisfying than a person who's severely dehydrated and then rehydrated. And if they're dehydrated from cholera or whatever it is, it's highly, highly satisfying. So the original ORS solution oral rehydration solution was sodium chloride, soda bicarbonate, potassium chloride, and glucose in these, uh, uh, in this composition. Uh, the first trials actually that we carried out uh, had a sodium of 110. This is lowered to 90, and now I think it's at around 70. So these are all very, very, very inexpensive ingredients. And potassium, if you don't have potassium chloride, it can be found in green coconut water, bananas, uh, and various citrus fruits. The key ingredient here is glucose. Glucose uh, uh, enhances the movement of sodium across the semi-permeable membrane and drags with it uh, water and so on. And this is the basic principle. I know it says, well, did you really have to do all that research to find out that if you have a plant that's dying, you ought to put some water in it? Well, physicians and medical people can be an obstinate group. And, uh, uh, and yes, this was, and even when this was demonstrated, and clearly demonstrated, so that 80% of the intravenous fluid that was required for severe cholera was saved through this. Even then, the most uh, reluctant group to use it were physicians. Imagine that. We can talk about that. This is uh, a rural treatment center in a place called Matla Bazaar. Matla Bazaar at that time was about two hours from Dhaka. You had to take two ferries and a motorboat to reach it. That white vessel there was actually a former jail that the British used to take up and down the river. You notice there's no electricity. You see the country boats and so on. I actually slept when I was doing some field work. I slept in those jail cells, making sure, of course, that the door had been removed before I went in. Uh, but this was Matlab. Matlab is known today as uh, the world's longest standing uh, demographic surveillance area. Uh, they've been measuring uh, births, deaths, in migration, out migration since the very early 60s because it was set up uh, to uh, evaluate cholera vaccines. So here's a little girl. Uh, once we demonstrated that this oral therapy solution could save 80% of the uh, uh, of the IV, and that people were in good electrolyte balance and everything was was fine, we then moved to Matla. Why? Because if this was going to be have an impact on diarrhea. Uh, anywhere in the world, and certainly in East Pakistan, it had to be used at a rural treatment center. So here's a little girl who's got that same look, and her mother is now involved in the treatment. Why is this important? Because the initial treatment of all of these children 
is going to be from the mother. It's going to be from the family. Okay? And here the mother is now involved in the care of her child. And so when she goes back home, she's prepared to do it again. And here's the little girl 12 hours later. So we went from DACA and the, the uh, measuring electrolytes and stool and so on and doing all of the uh, basic science that was necessary. Uh, we then went to Matla. Just to point out to you, which, which you already know, that a major contributor to severe malnutrition is diarrheal disease, oftentimes uh, uh, triggered by uh, a formula, infant formula, and so on. And here's a woman, this is, I think I took this in Chennai, uh, or, uh, uh, with a, uh, she's very poor, obviously, and the child has photophobia, the hair is thinning, uh, this child clearly has marasmus, and here is another child with Morasmus Quashiorcor, again, in a very poor family. Now you don't, the fact is you don't see much of this anymore. The incidence of this has come way down. Now part of it is due to the better treatment with, uh, of diarrhea, but there are many, many other factors which we could get into, if you'd like, uh, that account for this. So we always, we always recommended that breastfeeding continue. It never stops. And that feeding never stopped. If you looked at the Western textbooks at this time, uh, they would tell you that, uh, oh, you should stop feeding. But that was, that was a Western textbook. And so the Western pediatric textbooks who were being read by people from India and throughout South Asia and so on were being followed, but it was by physicians who were not working here. They didn't recognize that stopping feeding uh, was actually uh, uh, deleterious to the child. In fact, there was a study done in 1948 in Romania uh, by Emmett Holt and others and showing that actually if you withheld food, diarrhea was prolonged. That the enzymatic content of the uh, of, of the small bowel was such that it had to be stimulated with food. But they had to do the study in Romania because the belief system was so strong in the U.S. and in the West that food was bad, they had to go outside to do the studies. But it showed that it worked. But even then, even though this was done in 1948, food was still being withheld. And that was certainly the case when I trained. Now, I want to come to the next uh, chapter in this, because I want to point out that the introduction and the development of any technology is based on a number of factors. One, the basic science. Uh, secondly, which, was, uh, which I didn't get into, uh, I've stayed away from, uh, but the basic science that showed that glucose enhanced the movement of sodium water across the semi-permeable membrane. Studies that were begun in the uh, early 60s in the Philippines and carried over uh, both in uh, Calcutta under the ICMR and in, and in uh, DACA at the Cholera Research Laboratory. And then the demonstration, the clinical demonstration that ORS worked, which is what I've just given you. The next phase, of course, was to demonstrate that it could be uh, expanded, that others could take it on. And this is where Professor Mahalanabas, where Dalip really comes in. Uh, because he recognized, because uh, this work was also going on in Calcutta and Dhaka, that ORS and ORT could be instituted, could be initiated in a larger environment. Talib joined the Johns Hopkins University Center for Research and Training in 1966. And he worked with colleagues like Nate Pierce and Brad Sack and John Banwell on testing ORT. 
When the Bangladesh War of Liberation began in 1971, there were over 10 million, just think about that, 10 million refugees who crossed over into India. And of course, cholera broke out in a number of camps leading to outbreaks of cholera with mortality as high as 30% in some of these sites. Working in the Bengal uh, refugee camp, Dilip used market ingredients to produce sachets of ORS as Iwi was clearly running out and believed strongly in uh, this because of the work that his colleagues had done and that what had happened in, in Dhaka. Mortality was dropped tenfold from 30% to 3.6%. What was also very interesting is that the demonstration caught the attention of WHO's Dr. Demon Barua. Now, Dr. Demon Barua uh, actually had grown up outside of Chittagong and had been head of the uh, diarrhea program at WHO. And Demon said, wow, this is really exciting stuff. And was as responsible as anyone for scaling up the WHO approach to treating diarrhea. They were able to get the uh, cost of the ORS down to one and a half cents per liter. The, uh, the, co the cholera that was present in these environments was classical cholera. Um, and uh, the recommendations given by uh, Dilip were to uh, give as much as possible by mouth of this oral solution. Because he knew that uh, it was very difficult to significantly overhydrate a patient on oral solution. Now, how did you know that the person was properly hydrated? Did you have to do central venous pressure? How, what was the strategy? Well, what is the strategy? The strategy is if you're passing urine and that urine is relatively low uh, specific gravity, the person is hydrated, okay? So all along the way, and this was so uh, important, is that he could clearly demonstrate not only that you could hydrate, well, that you could teach people how to use oral rehydration therapy, uh, building on uh, work that had been done in DACA and elsewhere. And so he was able to ramp up these programs and treated, I think, over 3,000 individuals or more by, and kept the mortality extremely low. Uh, this was extremely important. As I noted, Dilip was uh, an excellent scientist, modest, courteous, generous, possessing a very gentle sense of humor, and always a teacher. All the people that I've spoken to who knew Dilip well always remark on his generosity in teaching others how to do things. I was just, uh, I was in Dhaka before I came here and the director of the ICDDRB, uh, Dr. Tamit Ahmed, uh, who was uh, a friend of Dilip, uh, remarked how uh, he had been a student of his and how much he had benefited from Dilip's mentoring, from Dilip's teaching of him, and uh, how broken up he was when uh, Dilip passed away. Well, here's the situation that Dilip found himself. This is near Salt Lake area, and thousands and thousands of refugees coming here, no place to stay, so they stayed in the sewer pipes. And of course, when you have thousands and thousands of people coming together, water and sanitation are critical. Uh, we are much further along today than we were then. Cholera broke out. Uh, this is uh, from a paper that uh, Dalip published on his experience there. Uh, people coming forward. Here's a child that is brought in uh, uh, into the uh, area for treatment. And here is the oral therapy uh, distribution uh, uh, site that he set up 
so that people could come forward, collect the oral therapy solution, and give it to their uh, family members and loved ones. The next stage that occurred in the development of this was how do you get this out into the community? The LEAP had shown that you could do this uh, uh, in disaster situations. We showed that mothers could learn how to, to use this. Now how do you get it out into the community? Where one strategy was let's just put it up in packets like this and then give it to people. Here's a school teacher who's distributing the packets. There's, there's a problem with this though. These packets are for one liter. What is one liter? Is there a standard container in rural Bengal, which everybody has, that will give you one liter? That's one problem. So someone said, well, let's, instead of packaging it, why don't we use different sizes of spoons? Well, when they went out to do this, they found out that, well, what's the standard size spoon? How many spoons of salt and sugar and so on? Well, depends on what size spoon you got. And we found some communities that had no spoons. So they made up spoons. Seems like a good idea. Salt on one side, sugar on the other. Uh, this is from Indonesia. The only problem is literacy was about 5%. So all those nice instructions you can't read. And the second problem is, of course, you still have to have a standard glass a standard container and there was none so what do you do what do the people tell you to do well this is a picture from Nicaragua and what is the standard container here is it the Pepsi bottle is it the canteen is it the whiskey bottle who knows because there was no standard container so what you do is you make a standard container and you distribute them. So here's a, a pre-packaged uh, from UNICEF of salt and sugar and so on put into a container that is one liter. However, you got to make the container, you got to distribute the container. And people have to know still how to do this. Uh, that was a problem. So working with an NGO in Bangladesh uh, uh, BRAC, which is actually the world's largest NGO, the director, uh, Sir Fosley Abbott, who passed away a few years ago, came up with this formula, a three-finger pinch of salt and a scoop of sugar. Of course, people don't have these sugar. That isn't the, how they collect sugar in the rural areas. It's usually gour. Uh, and so on, which is actually better because before you refine sugar, uh, it actually has potassium in it. And if you add that to a half a liter, you get a solution that is reasonably good, can be given early on, and so on. Now the next question is, does it work? Well, they set up a cutter of young women who would go out into the community I always show this to my students and they say, why are they, why do they have umbrellas? It's sunny outside. I said, haven't you ever heard the expression that only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the noonday sun? So these folks are saying, I'm neither a mad dog nor an Englishman. And of course, you can always tell about what year it is by the dress of the young men who go to the villages ahead of time. And so when these young workers would go to the community, they would find uh, the women and children there. The men were out in the field. And here's the worker. She is dressed in green. And the mother has come out with her child. Now any of you who've done teaching or training in a clinic knows that it's very difficult. The children are running around, they're screaming, there's general chaos. Here it's quiet. So the mother is there and she's been asked to bring out a white pan, anything from her house. The worker then takes that cup, which is for 500 cc's, half a seer, pours it into the mother's pan, 
and scratches a line. So now you have a 500 cc container which you use for a pinch of salt and a scoop of sugar. The child is there and the mother can try it out and she can taste it. In the course of doing this work they also found out two things that the use was a bit less than they had anticipated and so they wondered why. Well it turns out that the OTEP workers, those young women who were going house to house, didn't really believe in what they were doing. They were teaching, they were giving all the lessons, but they really didn't believe in what they were doing. And so they needed to be brought to DACA and be put onto the ward to see that actually this, this did work. And secondly, uh, this allowed mothers to taste it. Now some of the, the only women at this time that were going house to house in the rural communities were family planning workers. So some of the rural women said, well, <laughs> we know what you're doing. You're trying to introduce family planning. And so the OTEP worker actually had to taste the, the fluid in front of the village woman so that she was assured that this was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And she knew what it now, how salty it was. This was reinforced with posters. In some areas, women uh, were not used to seeing these sorts of things. So that picture with the three hands, people said, well, where's the rest of the body? You know, how come they're disembodied like this? Uh, and so uh, this had to be uh, described. Now, when I describe for you the method of evaluation, you will appreciate this. Uh, the workers said, you know, uh, the men are making a lot of the decisions. So we can't just teach the mothers and the caretakers. And so they expanded this to teach the young men also, the doctors in blue there. And then they further worked on it and showed that you could each teach four mothers at the same time. What's interesting about this picture, uh, which you wouldn't see today, is all the children there, because now most of these kids are in school. But children are fast learners, and they're going to learn quicker than their mothers will. And they're learning at the same time. Now, how do you evaluate a program like this? How do you do it? How do you take something to the people and then evaluate whether they learned or not? Well, they did something very clever, actually. Uh, the young man is one of the evaluators. Now, each OTEP worker was allowed to see up to 10 mothers a day, no more. So over a month, she would see about 300. Okay. This evaluator is now going to a subsample of that 300 and asking the mother, can you tell me what this is, what this oral therapy is? They had reduced the number of points to seven. They had started out with 18, which was too many. Then they got it to 11. They eventually ended up with seven points to remember. If the mother knew six or seven and could prepare the solution, it was recorded as an A. If she knew four or five, it was recorded as a B. Two or three, a C. And if she couldn't prepare the solution, no credit. Now, why do we do this? Because now the worker is evaluated. If you've seen 300 people and 90% of them are A, and you give five rupees for every A, it's five times 0.9 times 300, and the same for C and D. So at the end of the day, you know two things. One, how much knowledge is out there, and two, is your worker doing a good job? You don't want to say, boy, did we save a lot of money this month. Nobody learned anything. You want to maximize what you're doing. So the purpose of the program was to teach mothers not to increase the use of ORT because that's the mother's prerogative 
uh, and so that's what they evaluated. It would be like evaluating us teachers based on what our students learn. I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> At least not in my institution. It also uh, became apparent later on that you could use rice water uh, instead of uh, glucose because rice is just a series of glucoses stuck together. So what are the lessons from the ORT story? One, you need to promote evidence-based interventions. Studies had been done or reports had been written in the 50s, in the 40s, early 60s, but it was all anecdotal. Uh, there was not good science behind this and therefore these ideas were not taken up. We need to support translational research. How do you translate something from the laboratory into the field? And give credit and recognize the importance of applied work. We need to understand the context by taking research to the people and learning from them. Context determines how success is measured. I went to, uh, in the middle of this, I was asked to go to Taiwan. There was a laboratory there, and they were saying uh, that it was failing in their hands. So I said, well, what do you mean by that? So they said, well, all of these people are vomiting after they get the oral therapy. I said, well, but if you continue on, uh, the vomiting will stop. And it does within a, two hours or something like that. But the nurses in the hospital said, we don't want to bother with this. I said, but we don't have hospitals for them to, not to reject it, okay? So in our hands, we were saving 80% of the IV therapy. In their hands, this was causing vomiting. So they said it failed in 30%. We said it always succeeded if you could save IV. So context is important. We need to overcome the no-do gap. We know something, but now how do you apply it? Which is what Talib did. We need to secure professional and political commitment. Low cost, acceptable, attainable, and sustainable interventions are often better than those that are more high tech. This requires us to think things out just a bit differently. Scientific evidence is the basis for appropriate treatment and prevention. Discoveries must be applied if they are to have maximum benefit. Intervention programs must be appropriate to context. We need to take research to the people and to be clear on what constitutes success. What is successful? In our hands, success was saving lives and saving IV. Political commitment is necessary for broad dissemination and use. And ethical issues may arise in the trade-off between access, accessibility, cost, and the best possible interventions. Uh, this is a picture from 2007. You see the leap uh, on your left uh, with David Nalen, myself, uh, a doctor, uh, Stanley Schultz, who did some uh, basic research on uh, uh, glucose transport uh, and sodium transport at the Mahidol uh, uh, award ceremonies uh, that were in 2007. And here is the leap with his wife, Sayanti, uh, in front of the portrait of, of uh, Prince Mahidol. Uh, I like this quote, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. And how do, you, how do you decide what is one bit simpler? You try things out. You try things out in the field. You, uh, uh, you do applied work. Let me just uh, end with a, a short quote, uh, a, a short example here, just to show you uh, that we're still uh, uh, this is still an extremely effective means of uh, ORT. Is still an extremely effective means of uh, preventing dehydration and death. This is flooding in 2009 in Dhaka. Similar things, of course, occur here. People using water.
for all sorts of things. Uh, these are young ladies going to the, uh, working in the garment industry. And you can see if you look in the back there, all the men are in boats. Hmm. That doesn't seem quite fair, but that's the way it is. And so getting water in the urban setting becomes extremely difficult. And there was a massive outbreak of cholera and diarrheal disease uh, uh, such that uh, this woman came in in shock and su such there were 43,000 cases admitted to the ICDDRB hospital in the course of nine weeks. 43,000. A little girl with, uh, came in in severe uh, uh, dehydration. Here they're using the rice-based ORS solution so that people at their bedside are consuming it, making the, the, the sheets with a hole and the cots and a 100-bedded hospital going up in a matter of 24 hours. But this is the slide that's so important. Because who's delivering most of the care? Most of the care is being delivered by family members. Okay? When you're getting a thousand admissions a day, the doctors and the nurses can't cope. So of those 43,000 people, there are only 16 deaths. And those 16 deaths occurred in people who have other compromises, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and so on. If this happened in the United States, if this happened in Boston, the Mecca, you know, hospitals all over the place, it would completely collapse our system because who takes care of all of the patients? They're taken care of by doctors and nurses. Here are the family members because the knowledge of ORT is higher here than in most any other country. So most of the care is being de delivered by family members. So what I've tried to do in the uh, short time available is to talk about the development uh, of ORT and the various contributions that many, many people had over years. Doing the basic science, which I didn't cover, the clinical trials, the sorting out of how to expand this to larger and larger populations, the use of it in a disaster situation which clearly demonstrated that uh, uh, this could be applied uh, in multiple situations that the LEAP uh, did and the contribution of the many people who were involved in this. And I think that it's a wonderful demonstration of what can be done uh, uh, in situ, what can be done if we listen to what people say and if we look at the situation in which we're working in. So with those remarks, let me thank you, and uh, I look forward to any questions that you have. Dr. Cash, thank you very much. Uh, we've all seen one of the senior most clinical researchers, basic science researcher, and a fantastic storyteller all rolled in one. Um, who has saved many, many lives through his research and dedication to the community. Uh, this being an oration, I don't think we will take any questions, but Dr. Cash will be around, and therefore, if anybody has any questions, you can meet him, and he'll be happy to um, answer your question. This also uh, brings a lot of responsibility on the Liver Foundation, because this is the first Dilip Mahalanobis Memorial Lecture, and we all have the responsibility of continuing this series of uh, lectures and we hope that uh, we will get many volunteers who will be able to come and uh, describe their own work in the context of what uh, Dr. Malnobis had done. Thank you very much for coming in. We now have a short film uh, on Dilip Mahalanobis, uh, which was, uh, again, the architect is here. Uh, has been my colleague for many decades now, uh, Professor Prabal Choudhury of the Indian Statistical Institute. He's not a clinician, he's a statistician, 
Yet again, his interest in public health, his interest in uh, how lives are saved and, you know, the, the, the statistics underlying saving of lives and so on, uh, compelled him, and this was internal compulsion, compelled him to make, make this film, which is a very short film. It's in Bengali, so uh, many of us requested uh, Prabal to actually come and uh, uh, in a very short period of time, maybe five minutes, describe, uh, you know, his emotions and why he made the film and also describe the context of the film because it's primarily in Bengali. No, it's exclusively in Bengali. Uh, he wanted to make subtitles but time didn't permit. Uh, so, um, I uh, will seek the apology of all of, all of the people here who do not understand or speak Bengali. But uh, I hope that it will be clear from the context what uh, Dilip Malanobis is doing in this film. Uh, Prabhat. Very good evening to all of you. When I was asked to uh, bring this video to show to the uh, people who are present here, I was kind of nervous because I made this video completely in Bengali. But my job has been immensely simplified by the lecture by Dr. Cash. I think he has given complete English translation of my video. Okay. So, nobody I think will miss anything after his fantastic lecture. Okay. So, the video that I am going to show you is just sort of, if Dilip Mahalanobis had given this talk, what would have said? Something like that. Okay. So, uh, he was working under similar condition as Dr. Cash and uh, the way I came to know about this is kind of accidental. It's very unfortunate that we Bengalis sometimes don't know great people who are living among us. So Dr. Mohanabish was living in Salt Lake area till he passed away last year. And, but almost nobody around him or even in our elite academic community knew much about him. Uh, for reasons that I will not go into because I think we all know the reasons. But uh, what happened is that once I was traveling with one of my colleague and you will see him as one of the interviewer of Dr. Mahalanobish, he told me about Dr. Mahalanobish and then I became very curious and I started finding more materials and that sort of uh, made me contact Dr. Mahalanobish. When to talk to him I was kind of nervous because he was already an octogenarian at that time and I came to know about it only one year before the COVID pandemic started. So when I started doing this work, COVID was already in and visiting an octogenarian during this lockdown and COVID period and talking to him and getting this film done, I was not sure whether I should be doing that. Okay? So anyway, I talked to Dr. Mohanabish and he was very encouraging throughout. Okay? I have not met many people in my life who is so encouraging for anything that you will be doing for public good. So as soon as he heard these things, he became all supportive. And uh, so this documentary, when we interviewed him, it was shot at his house, creating a lot of disturbance to the family, but they uh, gladly was uh, going through that. And I got all kinds of support that I could get from him. And uh, what I have learned by talking to him is that you become a great scientist when you really have a love for science and love for how to use science for the benefit of people. Okay. So then nothing matters. Whether it is recognized through awards and prizes, it doesn't matter. You do it for your own satisfaction. Okay. And when we were uh, preparing this documentary, though Parthuda has uh, described me as the architect of this documentary. I am not the real architect. So I planned it, but the real architect of this documentary, to tell you the truth, are a bunch of undergraduate and postgraduate students in working in different universities. They are much more tech savvy than me. They can make videos and they can edit videos. They do a fantastic job. So I found them out by going to their uh, film competition or video competitions that they organize at different uh, uh, fests they organize and I picked up uh, two, three people who essentially prepared this documentary. So I was sort of uh, telling them what I expect from them and they were delivering it. Okay? And in course of that, there are a lot of 
discussions I had. Sometimes I had big fights with them also because they are, there is a big generation gap, okay. So things that I wanted, they didn't like it, but uh, many times we sort of came to a compromise. So eventually I believe it turned out to be a useful work and the reason we prepared it at that time was we wanted to make people aware of his work and in general how science can be brought to people. That's what Dr. Cash was telling. Okay. And let's start watching it now. And uh, I think uh, though it is made in Bengali, after Dr. Cash's lecture, almost nobody will have much difficulty following it. Okay. And uh, you will see the man whom we have lost now a few months ago. And uh, these quotes, all his awards, main awards, it doesn't quote about Padma Vibhushan that he got because this film was released before he was given that. We went through some uh, big uh, stumbles. For, for example, as we started, then it was during the COVID period and then the second phase of COVID came which was a lot more virulent than the first phase and we had to stop working. And my entire team was down with COVID infection. Those little kids, they were also down with COVID infection. And then something very sad happened. But fortunately, we managed to get the interviews done and we were doing the editing work. And then I had to show it to Dr. Mahalanavish before making it public. And then something very sad happened. Dr. Mahalanavish's wife passed away and I didn't want to disturb him at that time. Okay? So it, was, it got delayed further. And after all these things, we eventually released it. We are working on the subtitle and hopefully we will do it some other time. Okay. Thank you very much. Oti Madi. এই মুহূর্তের পৃথিবীতে এর চেয়ে বেশি পরিচিত শব্দবোধ হয় আর দ্বিতীয়টি নেই তবে না করোনা নয় অতিমারির প্রসঙ্গে আজ আসবে কলেরার কথা গত দুশো বছরে এই বিশ্ব পেরিয়ে এসেছে কলেরার সাত সাতটি অতিমারি তার উপর গেল শতকের নয় দশকে দক্ষিণ আমেরিকা কিংবা হালফিলের ইয়েমেনে ঘটে যাওয়া তার বিস্ফোরক প্রাদুর্ভাবের মতো ছোট বড় অগুন্তি সংক্রমণের কথা না হয় বাদই দিলাম বিশ্ব স্বাস্থ্য সংস্থার দেয়া সাম্প্রতিক তথ্য অনুসারে এখনও পর্যন্ত কলেরা ও ডায়রিয়া সংক্রমণে প্রতি বছর এই পৃথিবীতে মারা যায় লক্ষ লক্ষ মানুষ বিশেষত শিশুরা কলেরার মোট সাতটি অতিমারির মধ্যে প্রথম ছটি হয় আঠেরোশো ষোলো থেকে উনিশশো তেইশ সালের মধ্যে পরপর প্রসঙ্গত উল্লেখ্য এদের মধ্যে সর্বপ্রথম অতিমারিতি ঘটে গিয়েছিল তৎকালীন ভারতবর্ষের অবিভক্ত বাংলা প্রদেশে আঠেরোশো সতেরো থেকে আঠেরোশো চব্বিশ সালের মাঝামাঝি সময় উনিশ শতাব্দীর শেষ দিকে আঠেরোশো উনআশি থেকে আঠেরোশো তিরাশি সাল নাগাদ কলেরার প্রথম টিকা আবিষ্কার করেন ফরাসি বৈজ্ঞানিক লুই পাস্তুর তারপরেও বেশ কিছুটা সময়ের ব্যবধানে ঘটে যায় সপ্তম ও শেষ কলেরা অতিমারি উনিশশো একষট্টিতে ভারতবর্ষের মতো ক্রান্তীয় দেশে যেখানে তীব্র দাপট দেখায় আর্দ গ্রীষ্মকাল বছরের বেশিরভাগ সময় তাপমাত্রার পারদ যেখানে ঊর্ধ্বমুখী কলেরা চোখ রাঙানি সেখানে ভয়াবাহ আকার নেয় আজও থেকে থেকেই তার একটা মুখ্য কারণ এদেশের বিরাট সংখ্যক মানুষের দারিদ্র রেখার নিচে বসবাস ভারতের বিস্তীর্ণ এলাকায় আজও পরিষ্কার শৌচালয়ের অভাব স্বাস্থ্যসম্মত নিকাশি ব্যবস্থা নিয়মিত জলের যোগান বিধিমাফিক জঞ্জাল সাফাই কিংবা জীবাণুমুক্ত পানীয় জলের বিলাসিতা এখনও এই একুশ শতকেও এদেশের বিপুল একটি জনসংখ্যার ধরাছোঁয়ার বাইরে এ হেন পরিস্থিতিতে বছর বছর বিশেষত বর্ষাকালে কলেরার মতো জলবাহিত রোগের প্রকোপ অত্যন্ত স্বাভাবিক ও অনিবার্য ঘটনা 
উনিশশো এপার বাংলার রেডিও পিকিংয়ে যখন বসন্তের বজ্রনির ঘোষ উপার বাংলায় তখন ঘন ঘোর মুক্তি সংগ্রাম সেই টালমাটাল দুঃসময়ের অন্ধকার দিন রাত এক করে লক্ষ লক্ষ ছিন্নমূল মানুষ পেরিয়ে এসেছে অশান্ত পূর্ব পাকিস্তানের সীমান্ত রেখা জন্তু জানোয়ারের মতো গাদাগাদি ভিড়ে উপচে পড়ছে বনগাত থেকে কুপার স্ক্যাম্প শরণার্থী শিবির এরই ভিতর অতর্কিতে বনগার উদ্বাস্ত কলোনি উজার করে হানা দিল কলেরা মহকুমা হাসপাতালের হাতে গোনা ষোলোটি শয্যা বাজি রেখে শুরু হলো কলেরার সঙ্গে যুদ্ধ প্রাণপণ নেতৃত্বে ডক্টর দিলীপ মহালনবিশ ওষুধপত্র ইন্ট্রাভেনাস সমস্ত ভাঁড়া চোখের পলকে শূন্য হয়ে গেলে এ লড়াইয়ের একমাত্র অস্ত্র হল লবণ জলের তীর ও আর এস নুন চিনি জল আর সোডিয়াম বাইকার্বোনেটের সামান্য উপকরণ সম্বল করেই ডক্টর মহলানবিশ যোগান দিলেন অফুরান বিশল্যকরণী মৃত্যুহার নেমে এলো ম্যাজিকের মতো উনিশশো একাত্তরের চব্বিশে জুন থেকে তিরিশে অগস্ট ও আর এসকে হাতিয়ার করে চলেছিল তাঁর মরণপণ লড়াই এগারোশো নব্বই জন সংকটজনক রোগীর মধ্যে সে যাত্রায় মারা গিয়েছিল মাত্র একজন বাংলাদেশ মুক্তিযুদ্ধের পঞ্চাশ বছর পর ছোট্ট এই তথ্যচিত্রটি সেই মানুষটির প্রতি আমাদের যথাসাধ্য শ্রদ্ধা নিবেদন যার তৈরি ও আর এস ফর্মুলা শুধু সেদিনের উদ্বাস্ত শিবিরে নয় এমনকি আজও সারা পৃথিবী জুড়ে আন্তরিক রোগের গ্রাস থেকে বাঁচিয়ে চলেছে অসংখ্য মানুষের প্রাণ নিরন্তর ডক্টর দিলীপ মহালানবিশকে আমরা চিনি অনেক বছর ধরে উনি বিশেষত কলেরা এবং ডায়রিয়ার বিভিন্ন যে 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 কারণে ডায়রিয়া হয় কলেরা বা শিগেলা যেটা আন্তরিক বা আমাশয় বলা হয় সেইগুলোর যে চিকিৎসা দরকার এবং সেইগুলো যে তার জন্য কোনো অ্যান্টিবায়োটিকের সেরকম করে রোল নেই ওরাল রিহাইড্রেশন সলিউশন দিয়েই সেটাকে চিকিৎসা করা যায় তো এইটাই হচ্ছে ওনার বিশ্ববিখ্যাত হয়েছে এই কারণেই আমরা গর্বিত যে ওনার মতন একজন ব্যক্তিত্ব আমাদের সঙ্গে আমরা পেয়েছি কিন্তু তখনও বুঝিনি যে উনি কতটা উঁচু ধরনের বিজ্ঞানী নম্র মিতভাস এই মানুষটির জন্ম পূর্ববঙ্গের বাজিতপুরে উনিশশো চৌত্রিশের বারোই নভেম্বর এরপর কলকাতায় আসা উনিশশো একান্ন সালে হেয়ার স্কুল থেকে সেই সময় ম্যাট্রিক পরীক্ষায় পাশ কাকতালীয় কিনা জানা নেই এই হেয়ার স্কুলেরই প্রতিষ্ঠাতা বিখ্যাত ডেভিড হেয়ারও মারা গিয়েছিলেন কলেরা সংক্রমণে আঠেরোশো বিয়াল্লিশ সালে পরবর্তীতে বেলুর রামকৃষ্ণ মিশন বিদ্যামন্দির থেকে বিজ্ঞানে তৎকালীন ইন্টারমিডিয়েট ডিগ্রি অর্জন করেন ডক্টর মহালানবিশ তারপর কলকাতা মেডিকেল কলেজ থেকে উনিশশো সালে এমবিবিএস শেষ করে সেখানে কিছু সময় ইন্টার্নশিপ করে পাড়ি দেন ইংল্যান্ড মাত্র আঠাশ বছর বয়সে প্রথম ভারতীয় হিসাবে সেখানে তাঁর কুইন এলিজাবেথ হসপিটাল ফর চিলড্রেনে রেজিস্ট্রার পদে যোগদান লন্ডন থেকে ডিসিএইচ ডিগ্রি অর্জন করে এরপর তাঁর এমআরসিপি এদিনবাড়া বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় থেকে মার্কিন যুক্তরাষ্ট্রের জনস হপকিন্স ইউনিভার্সিটিতে কিছুদিন কাটিয়ে ডক্টর মহালানবিশ উনিশশো চৌষট্টি সাল নাগাদ ফিরে এলেন দেশে যোগ দিলেন কলকাতার বেলেঘাটা আইডিতে জনস হপকিন সেন্টার ফর মেডিক্যাল রিসার্চ অ্যান্ড ট্রেনিং বিভাগে সেখানেই শুরু হলো তাঁর কাজ ও আর এস নিয়ে একসময় তো কলে রাতে থার্টি পারসেন্ট মর্টালিটি ছিল মানে তিরিশ একশো জনের মধ্যে তিরিশ জন লোক মারা যেতেন এবং আপনারা আপনি নিশ্চয়ই জেনে থাকবেন যে শরৎচন্দ্রের কিছু কিছু উপন্যাসে কিন্তু কলেরা মহামারি আকারে গ্রামকে গ্রাম কিন্তু কলেরার জন্যে মানুষ মারা গেছেন কলেরাতে তো সেইখান থেকে আমরা এখন অনেকটাই কিন্তু ভালো পরিস্থিতিতে আছি যে অবস্থা হয়েছিল তাতে বহু লোক মারা গেছিল 
সেই অবস্থা দেখলাম যে সেটা এখানে একটু কিছু করতে হবে সেই অবস্থাতে আমাদের যা চিকিৎসা বা শিক্ষা যেটা আমাদের রয়েছে সেই অনুযায়ী ওইখানে তার আগেই আমরা যেটা চেষ্টা করছিলাম যে মানুষ বাচ্চাদের মুখে খাইয়ে সেলাইটা মুখে খাইয়ে কাজটা করে দেখি উনি এইরকম একটা ছাত্রদল তৈরি করতে পেরেছিলেন যারা অনুপ্রাণিত হয়ে ওনার আদর্শে অনুপ্রাণিত হয়ে এই কাজটা করতে পেরেছিল সেইটার ফলে এখন সারা বিশ্ব জুড়ে ডায়রিয়ার মর্টালিটি এবং মর্বিডিটি অর্থাৎ মৃত্যুর হার এবং অসুস্থতার হার অনেকটাই কমে এসছে এবং আরেকটা জিনিস যেটা ওনারা পরবর্তীকালে আরও ভালো দেখিয়েছিলেন যে শুধুমাত্র ওয়ারএস দিয়ে ভাইরাল ডায়রিয়াগুলো চিকিৎসা করা উচিত কোনো ওষুধ লাগবে না অন্য কোনো ওষুধের দরকার হবে না এমনকি ওয়ারএস দিলে যে বমিও কমে যায় ইলেকট্রোলাইট লেভেলটা ঠিকঠাক হওয়ার জন্য সেটাও ওনারা দেখাতে পেরেছিলেন কলেরা ব্যাকটেরিয়া সংক্রামিত জলপানের মাধ্যমে অজান্তেই আমাদের পাকস্থলিতে ঝাঁকে ঝাঁকে প্রবেশ করে এই জীবাণুটি আমাদের মতো বেহাল নিকাশি ব্যবস্থার দেশে এই ঘটনা নিতান্তই সাধারণ ক্ষুদ্রান্তে পৌঁছে এই ব্যাকটেরিয়া গুণোত্তর প্রগতিতে তার সংখ্যা বাড়ায় তারপর তারা আমাদের অন্ত্রের ভিতর খরণ করে এক রকমের বিষ বা টক্সিন আন্তরিক গহবরের পৃষ্ঠদেশীয় কোষগুলি যেটিকে শুষে নেয় এর ফলে শুরু হয় একগুচ্ছ জৈব রাসায়নিক বিক্রিয়া যেগুলি জল অণুর সাথে সাথেই সোডিয়াম পোটাশিয়াম ক্লোরাইড এবং বাইকার্বোনেটের মতো কিছু অপরিহার্য আয়নকে কোষ থেকে নিংড়ে বার করে স্বাভাবিক অবস্থায় এই আয়নগুলি কোষের ভিতর থেকে বাইরে এবং বাইরের থেকে ভিতরে অবাধ চলাচল করতে পারলেও কোষের মধ্যে কলেরা টক্সিনের উপস্থিতি এদের পুনঃশোষণকে প্রতিহত করে এরই ফলস্বরূপ বমি বা ডায়রিয়ার মতো কলেরার বৈশিষ্ট্যসূচক উপসর্গগুলি দেখা দেয় শরীর থেকে খুব দ্রুত ও বেশি পরিমাণে জল বেরিয়ে যাওয়ার কারণে গুরুতর নিরুদন বা ডিহাইড্রেশন ঘটে কলেরা সংক্রামিত রোগী তাই সরাসরি কলেরা টক্সিনের প্রভাবে মারা যান না মারা যান ব্যাপক জলশূন্যতার দরুন এই পরিস্থিতিতে এমন এক রোগীকে শুধুমাত্র জল খাওয়ালেই তার কোষে কোষে জলের শোষণ কার্যকরী হয় না কোষের পরিধিতে বেশ কিছু বাহক বা ট্রান্সপোর্টার থাকে যাদের ভূমিকা অনেকটা দারোয়ানের মতো এক্ষেত্রে যেমন জানা যায় যে কোষের ভেতর সোডিয়াম ও গ্লুকোজ শোষণের সাথে সাথে একই সঙ্গে ঢুকে পড়ে হাজার হাজার জলের অণু কাজেই এইখানে তার খেলা দেখায় ওয়ারএস এর প্রাথমিক উপাদান হল জলে দ্রবীভূত গ্লুকোজ আর খাদ্য লবণ যা কিনা সোডিয়াম আয়নের উৎস হিসাবে কাজ করে সুতরাং ওয়ারএস পানের মাধ্যমে গ্লুকোজ ও সোডিয়াম দেহে প্রবেশ করে এবং শোষিত হতে শুরু করে কোষের ভেতর একই সাথে কোষের মধ্যে ঢুকতে থাকে বিপুল পরিমাণ জলের অণু ফলত খুব তাড়াতাড়ি রোগীর দেহে পুনরুদন বা রিহাইড্রেশন ঘটে বনগার সেই শরণার্থী ক্যাম্পে যখন প্রাণপন লড়ে যাচ্ছেন ডক্টর দিলীপ মহালানবিশ একদিন সেখানে তখন সশরীরে হাজির হলেন বিশ্ব স্বাস্থ্য সংস্থা অর্থাৎ হুয়ের ব্যাকটেরিয়াল ডিজিজ বিভাগের ডিরেক্টর ডক্টর ধীমান বড়ুয়া তার দেয়া রিপোর্টে সাথে অন্য সব পরিসংখ্যান ভিত্তি করে পরবর্তীতে হু ডায়রিয়া চিকিৎসায় ওয়ারএস ব্যবহারকে বাধ্যতামূলক ঘোষণা করে তারপরে অবশ্য বিভিন্ন সূত্রে আমার কাজে প্রচার হয়ে যায় মানে প্রায় 
बहुत मैंने कोई रकम बड़ो छोटो सरकम को भाग छो और एक जगह छोड़ असम्भव बनय असम्भव स्नेह से मैं एखार माथा एत सजीव एत एत सुतीक्षण उनार चिंताधारा और शुद्ध शुद्ध डाक्त नए शुद्ध रिसार्च नए जीवन सम्बन्धे उनार मैं ज्ञान गभर से व्यक्तिगत भाव बहुत प्रकार पे हाथे धरे ब्लैक बोर्डे आलोचना करे अबारित दाड़ी जख फोन कर शरीर भलो थक खराब थक संगे संगे इंटरटेन कर सब समय कृतज्ञ थकब जो उन्नी पथे चालिए से ही पथ अनुसरण कर लाभवान सठीक विज्ञान करते पे दायित्वपूर्ण पदे एल तक मन हो सज करत से हल आरक नर नाम एक हल तैरि कर हलटा छो जो छात्र अवस्था इसी तक वही हले क्लस करी तब से ही हलटा के खूब नतून कर सजानो एयर कंडिशन बसानो डैस तैरि कम्पिटारे प्रोजेक्शन ये सब तैरि समस्त किसूल तक मन हलो एखे जो हलगुलो आगू नामकरण कर दरकार प्रथम जार नाम मन हो बस क्या कर पेचन दिखे हलटा से हीजे ओ हलटार नाम सर नाम करते पे सौभाग्य जो सर से अनुमति दिए उन्नी दायित्व उद्बोधन कर मजार बेपार हो एक जगह हस्पिटल हासपत बुझे गई बुजल साल बारोई जान डर महालानबीस बनगार से ओआरएस कर्मकांड प्रकाश करें द जन्स हपकिनस मेडिकल जार्नल वल्यूम एकश बत्रिशे ओआरएसटाई एक जुगानकारी आविष्कार जेटा लैंडसेटे एक समय लैंडसेट एक बोलब जार्नल जो हम खूब ही 
হাই ইম্প্যাক্ট ফ্যাক্টর জার্নাল যেখানে এই আবিষ্কারকে কিন্তু বিংশ শতাব্দীর সবচেয়ে বড় আবিষ্কার বলা হয় যেটা ওআরএস একটা অতি সাধারণ সলিউশন যার মধ্যে একটু নুন চিনি এই দিয়েই সলিউশনটা হয় কিন্তু এই ব্যবহার করার পরে তার যে উপকারিতা সেটার ব্যাপকতা ভীষণ বেশি আমরা শুনেছি এরকম কিছু গল্প যে আপনার নাম কয়েকবার নোবেল পুরস্কারের জন্য নমিনেটেড হয়েছিল সেই সময় তারপরে সেটা শেষ পর্যন্ত হয়নি যদি এই কাজ থেকে অনেকেই মনে করে যে নোবেল প্রাইজ পাওয়ার মতন কাজ তা এই ব্যাপারে কিছু বলবেন এই ব্যাপারে যেটা ঘটেছিল কিন্তু সেটা আবার সেই ঠিকেশন এটা তো আমারই করা কাজে ওদের সেটা কোনো কবি নেই কাজে আমার নাম স্টেট ঢুকে যাচ্ছে একজন নোবেল প্রাইজের জন্য তারপর তিনজন জন সবকিসের ওই দিকে যারা কাজকর্ম করেছেন তারা ওই ধরনের ফিল্ডে ওই রকম কাজ করেননি তারা ওই জন্য গেছে না আমাদেরও ই করতে হবে তিনজন পাশ একজন চারজন হয়েছে এই তিনজনই আমেরিকান বিভিন্ন সময় কিন্তু আমার একটা ইয়ে রয়েছে বলতে পারেন যে সত্যিকারের এত সুবিধে পেয়েছি কত লোক কিছু আমার কত করে যে আমি ভেবেই পাই না এখন তাদের নাম আলাপ আইসিডিজিআর পি যে ডাক আছে ওটা তো বিরাট ইন্টারন্যাশনাল দিয়ে আমাকে ডিরেক্টার করে দিলে তোমরাও বলো যে ওকে ছেড়ে দাও ঠিক হয়নি আমার কারণ লন্ডন থেকে ওরা যখন আসতো ওরা আইসিডিজের বিয়েতে এসে একটু ইয়ের মতন থাকতো আর কি ওই সব কিছু বলতে গিয়ে কি বলবে মানে ওখানে আমাদের কাজকর্ম অনেক প্রচুর ছিল এতগুলো ইন্টারন্যাশনাল জার্নাল সাতাশটা কান্ট্রি থেকে আসছে ওখানে তামিল ডিরেক্টার যদি ওখানে ওরা পিছু পাবে তারপরে ওরা নিজেরা অনেকবার অনেক প্রচুর বলেছে দিল্লি করে ছেড়ে দেওয়া ঠিক হয়নি অর্জন করেন ডক্টর দিলীপ মহালানবিশ এছাড়াও ও আর এস এর বিশ্বজয় দু হাজার ছয় সালে তাঁকে এনে দেয় থাইল্যান্ডের সর্বোচ্চ রাষ্ট্রীয় সম্মান মাহিডল অ্যাওয়ার্ডের খেতা আর এই সমস্ত কিছুর চেয়েও যা বড় সেই পুরস্কার হয়ে আজও ও আর এস বাঁচিয়ে চলেছে কলেরা ও ডায়রিয়া আক্রান্ত লক্ষ লক্ষ মানুষের প্রাণ অবিরাম As you have seen, uh, Dr. Mahalo Nobis comes back to life in this documentary. Thank you very much, Prabhupada, for doing this. Uh, we do hope that you will have the patience to do subtitles on this film so that everybody can understand. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful oration, the first Dilip Mahalo Nobis oration and then followed by this film. Um, it is time for me to thank all of you, particularly Dr. Richard Cash, who delivered the oration, Professor Praval Choudhury, who made this film and took the time to introduce the film and show us the film, 
and to all of you for uh, being here with us this evening. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, the, the group that's actually carrying forward the mantle of uh, Dilip Mala Nobis uh, through uh, Dr. Nita Bhandari and her team, uh, the CHRD SAS, uh, which has uh, shifted its center of gravity in de uh, to Delhi, but uh, the Calcutta SAS still exists and Nita is actually providing the leadership. And thank you very much, Nita, for uh, providing the leadership, carrying his mantle forward, and uh, you know, for all of you to have come here on this particular day. We hope that uh, you know, this, this legacy will uh, carry on. And in spite of the fact that Dr. Dilip Malanobis did not get the Nobel, uh, that doesn't really matter. He saved millions of lives. And I also thank Dr. Cash for uh, actually saving millions of lives. Uh, in the film, we, Dr. Cash didn't mention about the basic science, but in the film we did see some glimpses of the basic science that underlies uh, the use of ORS. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening. Uh, the Liver Foundation has an ad added responsibility. And uh, Dr. Abhijit Choudhury, I must thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, organizing this first memorial oration. And we hope that we can keep the momentum and uh, you know, prepare ourselves for the second Dilip Mahal Nobis oration. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.